Would you welcome Larry back up on stage? How you doing? Good. You know, today what I want to do is uh, once again go uh, deal with heart issues uh, like we talked about last night. But uh, this time I want us to uh, take a look at uh, a really cool figure from the Old Testament. His name is Daniel. And Daniel is one of those guys, uh, not like Joseph of Arimathea where everybody knows the name but nobody knows the story. He's the guy where all kinds of people know the story. Even people who haven't uh, been to church know little parts of it. And uh, if you grew up in the church, you know all kinds of major parts of it. And yet, uh, the Bible really wasn't written to be a Sunday school curriculum. Are you aware of that? Uh, <laughs> there are all kinds of things. We're right now marching through the book of Genesis with our congregation. Uh, we we kind of move through books uh, like the speed of an arthritic snail. We were 68 weeks in Luke, and now we're, uh, uh, I think, the 16th week in Genesis. We're in verse 3. No, no. <laughs> we actually in chapter 19. But uh, all the way through, there are parts of the story. I just have fun with the congregation. Uh, on the weeks I'm preaching, I share it, with, as you mentioned, with a guy named Chris Brown. But um, I go, they never told you this in Sunday school, did they? And uh, Daniel has parts of it as well. Uh, sometimes it's because it's a little too earthy. Um, just a little sidebar here for, for fun. Uh, both Chris and I are kind of earthy. Uh, and uh, the other week, uh, I used the word shut up uh, numerous times in a message. Not telling somebody shut up, but, you know, just whatever is, you know, God saying something. Or... So I got my uh, <laughs> letter that I always get, little note or something like that. And the fun part of it is that North Coast... We really aim at men because we learned long ago if we reach the men, we reach the family. If we reach the wife, we will reach her and her kids until they grow and it's over. So that's, that's part of it. And, and once again, it was in the handwriting of a preschool mom who's trying to get her kids not to say, shut up. Uh, <laughs> it's like, well, we're not aiming at preschoolers. We have preschool over here. We're aiming at you and your husband and your sons and daughters and, and stuff. But... Uh, Again, there's all of these parts of the Bible that we leave out uh, very appropriately because the kid's not ready really for all of the end of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and his two daughters and, you know, like, whoa, and, and parts of Daniel. And, and some of it, they're just not even cognitively ready to live at that principle level that you do as your brain develops and you become more of, a, more of an adult. Uh, well, that's what we're going to look at really today in, uh, ch from chapter 1 of, of Daniel. Uh, because Daniel, what he amazes me by doing is he thrives in Babylon. Now, I don't know about you. Do you, do you ever feel like, like our culture is somewhat heading morally downhill? Just wonder if anybody feels that. <laughs> the thing about Daniel is Daniel was in a situation far worse than anything we could ever imagine. And yet he thrived. In fact, by the end of his life, he had led three national revivals. One thing you might want to do following up what I talk about today is just say in the next week or so, read Daniel. And a good thing to do when you read scripture sometimes that will pull out things that are beyond the obvious but are absolutely biblical is to read the Bible with a question in mind or put on a lens and read a passage. I first learned this uh, years ago. I was working on my doctorate and uh, we had a professor who wanted us to understand this concept. And uh, what he did is um, he gave us all a book of the Bible, and he said, I want you to prepare teaching on what this book says about marriage. And he gave me the book of James. Now, if you know anything about the book of James, it's got all kinds of stuff, but it doesn't say a word about marriage. Until you suddenly say, what does it say about marriage? Huh, no matter what situation I'm in, I'm trying to figure out. Ask for wisdom, and he will give it to us. Oh, yeah, I mean, just there, suddenly there was everything when I put that lens on. So here's what I recommend you do with Daniel, is this next week, just read through the book of Daniel and ask this question, how did Daniel behave toward his pagan, the pagan authorities in his life? And the second question is, what was his attitude? We're going to see most of it right here in this first chapter, but you'll see it repeated sometimes in spades as we go through the... Uh, uh, rest of the book. But uh, first of all, I, I just want us to read through uh, Daniel, and if uh, you um, uh, have, uh, treat your Bible as a life textbook, we're always telling people at North Coast to do that. There'll even be some things you might want might to underline or uh, uh, mark up or, or highlight even in your uh, digital Bible. But let's go ahead and start uh, with the story, and then we're going to come out and pull out the principles. 
Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. He set his army all around it, cut off any supplies of food and water, and just waited it out until it was weak enough it had to wave the white flag and surrender. Now notice verse 2. And who delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hands? Talk to me. Who? The Lord. Underline that, circle it, star it. It is so important to the story and so important to what Daniel teaches us. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And not only that, it was along with some of the articles from the temple of God, devoted things that were there belonging to God. And these he carried off to the temple of his God, Baal, in Babylon. And he put the treasures house, he put them in the treasure house of his God. So what you've got here is Nebuchadnezzar, a damnable evil king, besieging God's people. God gives him victory. God also says you can raid the temple of all the valuable stuff that belongs to me, the kind of valuable stuff that, that much earlier in the Bible, a, a guy named uh, Achan was actually killed for, for holding back one of those things. You remember the Ark of the Covenant? There's another story. It's starting to fall, and they just want to touch it and write it and... and that's how holy it is, and God says, ah, you can have it. Not only that, he says, you can have it. You can take it all the way back to Babylon, and you can put it in the temple of your God as a symbol of mocking Jehovah God, of showing that your God is more powerful than Jehovah God. And who is it that allowed that? Help me out. The Lord allowed that. Hmm. Verse 3. The king ordered Asenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites in the royal family and nobility. And I love how Daniel describes himself and his friends. <clears throat> Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace, if I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, which, folks, is the occult. Astrology and the occult was the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Along with these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and the chief official gave them new names to Daniel name he gave the name Belshazzar, though we tend to know him as Daniel. In Babylon, they didn't call him that. They called him Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. And, of course, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and in my household, to bed we go. <coughs> <laughs> but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief uh, official for permission not to defile himself this way. Notice he didn't go up to this official, as we'll see in a few minutes, and say, you do not understand who I am. You do not understand who my God is. I am not going to eat your stinking food. Very politely, very respectfully, as you will see all the way through the book of Daniel, he looks for an alternative, willing to accept the consequences, but not even the slightest bit of chip on his shoulder in his behavior. So he asked for permission. Can I please not eat this? Now, Dan, uh, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the, Dan, uh, the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned you food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than other men your age? The king would have my head because of you. So Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for just ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to whatever it is you see. I'm more than willing to accept the consequences. A 10-day little trial can't hurt anything. It can't go that sour. How about just giving me a chance? I love his approach. So he agreed to this and tested him for 10 days. Well, verse 15 says, at the end of 10 days, they look healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and their wine that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, who gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds? Help me. God. God gave them the understanding 
of all kinds of literature and learning. What literature and learning are we talking about? The literature and learning of the Babylonians. Astrology and the occult. God gave them the skill set to graduate as valedictorian in those subjects. Hmm. How well did they do? Well, we're told that Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. In verse 18, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, and he talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. And not only were they at the top of their class, but in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the experienced magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel reign, remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. That's the story. Let me go back and point out a couple of things for you. First of all, how bad was it? How bad was Babylon? Babylon was as bad as you can get. In, in heaven, when they speak of Sin City, it's not Las Vegas. Babylon exists no more. There was a prophecy against it. It would be destroyed as it existed then and would never come back. And yet, when Jesus Christ returns in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, the first 24 verses, the angels shout out in great joy that finally justice is coming and evil is conquered. And what do they say? Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Why would they say that? Because Babylon was so evil that it is the biblical personification of evil. Whenever you want a word picture for evil, in the Bible, there is nothing more evil than Babylon. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. How bad was it as far as Babylon? Okay, you see that? How bad was it as far as Nebuchadnezzar? Well, this is a guy who raided God's temple, took holy things devoted to God, put him up in his God's temple to mock Jehovah God, as I showed you earlier. Now, there are a lot of decisions that get made, everything from in uh, legislatures to Congress to presidents to Supreme Courts to appellate courts or whatever, that as Christians at times we kind of go, what in the world is happening here? But I do want to point out something to you. We have had some areas of our faith pulled back we had, have had some areas of our faith where it's harder and harder to practice it. But we have had nothing, even within shouting distance, of what a Nebuchadnezzar did. And I want to remind you, who allowed him success? Help me. God did. We saw it twice in that passage. Well, the third thing is the culture. Man, sometimes we'll talk about culture wars in this uh, uh, world today. <laughs> I want to tell you, I mean, California is a land of fruits and nuts, believe me. I mean, the weather is great. <laughs> the weather is great. The taxes are unbelievably bad. And there are a whole lot of other things, you know, that you pay for surf being up and seeing the sun. But as bad as we've ever gotten in the worst of anywhere, we still do not have astrology and the occult as a core curriculum of our schools. That's the environment that he was in. Astrology and a cult with a core curriculum for you to get a prestige job. Hmm. Now, how bad was it for Daniel? How tough was his dilemma? Well, you've got to remember that he's a poor young man, and I know he's very brilliant, very handsome, and all the chicks thought he was hot. I mean, he says so himself, right? <laughs> but that created a little bit of problems as part of the royal family there uh, when he was uh, kidnapped. He was basically kidnapped and taken an incredible distance to another culture, another language. It was not one he knew anything about. You know, he couldn't get on Google Earth and see what it looks like. Uh, you know, he couldn't go to YouTube to see, how, well, what are some videos of what's going on? I mean, just the absolute horror of going from the royal family here to kidnapped and, and turned into a slave, though a royal slave there, culture. I mean, can you imagine how difficult that would be? Man, we think we've got some tough times at work or in situation. We've never, none of you have ever had anything close to that. On top of that, he was kidnapped, he was castrated, and his name was changed 
to honor Satan. Now, we know he's kidnapped because it's right there in the passage. We know his name was changed to honor Satan because Daniel means God is my judge. Belshazzar means Baal's prince. That's what they, everybody called him. Now, where do I get castrated? By the way, that's another one we don't teach in third grade Sunday school. Well, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it's implied in the scriptures. You realize, in, 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 first of all, in ancient culture, you wanted to have sons. That was a very big deal. And it wasn't just for legacy purposes. It was for social security purposes. If you didn't have any sons, you had no one to take care of you in old age. But for Jewish men as well, in the lineage promises and messianic promises and all that became even all the more important. And so having sons is something that's mentioned all the way throughout scripture. But everywhere you find Daniel, you find Daniel what? Alone. Never the mention of wife, never a mention of children. Which is all throughout the Old Testament scripture seen as a sign of God's disfavor. Though we know that you know, couples that are infertile or not under God's disfavor or whatever. But within the structure of the Old Testament economy, that's how they, they considered it. Here's something else we knew. Kings were ruthless. Jesus even talked to people who were made eunuchs and become eunuchs for the kingdom of God. As a king, like a Nebuchadnezzar, you not only had a queen or a wife, you had a harem. And you're, you're this old dog king. You got a whole lot of power and a whole lot of money. You got a lot of beautiful women over here, and you just brought in a bunch of slaves who were handsome and really smart and all of this other stuff. There's one thing you can do to make sure you don't have any problems with them. And it was a very common practice in the culture of that day. So everything from culture to experience to the role, the rest of the story tells us. Now, I don't know about you, but to be kidnapped, have my name changed to Larry Satan's servant, and to be castrated, that is a really bad week. <laughs> and yet, he thrived. So what is it? that he knew that somehow we so easily forget. There are three things that jump out at me in this story. And I just go, wow. Now, speaking here to pastors, leader, ch uh, lay leaders, and, and, and people who are at the forefront of, of churches, I want to challenge you not only to think of these in terms of your own life, but think of these in terms of the message you're communicating in whatever ministry you're in, because our people need to have these traits, not just a few of us. And the first one is this optimism despite that damnable culture and that horrible environment and all that he personally went through he was a man of faith and a man of optimism now how could he do that you see it all the way through the book well very simple he knew that even in babylon god is in control of who's in control and i cannot tell you at least at my church and as i travel around the country talking to other christians as well how often we forget that God is in control of who is in control. Romans chapter 13, the Roman government that called Christianity illegal, uh, a Nero who was taking Christians and persecuting them, taking some of their dead bodies, touring pitch over them and lighting them uh, to uh, light his parties and orgies, using them as corpse torches. Romans 13, the first few verses. God is in control of who is in control. We saw it twice in this passage. The Lord delivered. God gave them wisdom. When we forget that God is in control of who's in control, we lose optimism. When we lose optimism, we lose faith. And instead of standing strong and assaulting the gates of hell, we hunker down and we try to hide from the storm. You see, Jesus said, he, I will build my church and the what? Gates of hell will not prevail. Well, as a new Christian, you know what? I, I, I really thought that passage meant this. I'm going to build my church and whatever comes against it will not be able to win. But the problem is I didn't understand what a gate is. A gate is not an offensive weapon. Nations, armies, and Satan don't pick up a gate and run around saying, bam, bam, bam. A gate is a defensive structure. 
And Jesus didn't say, no matter what happens to you, you just kind of hunker down, get your salt way down in that salt shaker, get your light down, cover it all up by that little basket and everything like that, and it won't touch you. He said, whether you're in Babylon, wherever you are in history, wherever you are in culture, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against your advance. But what happens is sometimes, though we know the end of the story, we forget the end of the story. Panic and despair are not from God. Now, there's an appropriate time to be worried. There's an appropriate time to be sad. Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He rebelled against the plan three times in the garden of, 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 um, um, on the Mount of Olives, a Garden of Gethsemane, saying any other way that this can happen. But the idea of settling into despair instead of conquering despair, the idea of a pessimistic Christian, now that is an oxymoron because we know the rest of the story. And everything changes when we know the rest of the story, or it should, shouldn't it? I mean, I've, I've read this book. Yeah, it's in here. Uh, we win. <laughs> we really do. Now, let me illustrate how that changes everything. And I know the part of the country I'm in, so please forgive me, but um, I, and it's been a very bad year, uh, I am a Charger fan, a USC football fan, and a Laker fan. <laughs> so it has been a really bad year. But we have had our moments. And um, I think of two games that I have taped. One is a Laker game where they're 14 points down in the seventh game of the Western Division Finals trying to make it to the championships against a team called Portland. And the other is a USC game trying to win a national championship against, if you're a USC fan, your number one rival is not UCLA, it's Notre Dame. And you're playing Notre Dame, and uh, Notre Dame's about to destroy at South Bend an undefeated season. Both those games, though, were won. The Lakers came back out of nowhere and not only won that game, but went on to uh, the first Kobe Shaq uh, NBA championship. In the football game, it's third and five or six. Quarterback named Matt Leinert fades back, looks around. He's tackled for a sack. Uh, sack. It's now fourth and 13 or something like that. Less than a minute on the clock. As I'm watching that game live, just like the Laker game, but let's go to the football and I'll just pick that one. I happen to be watching it alone. I'm in, we have a library den thing. I'm in there watching it alone and I am up and I am all uptight like any of you who are fans are. Your team is losing, now something bad is happening. I'm walking around to get that energy off. I'm spouting Christian euphemisms. <laughs> you do too, don't you? You know what I mean. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord, but... <laughs> And then I'm, yes! Long story short, Leinert fades back on fourth down, throws this impossible pass. The guy catches it, runs down to about the one-foot yard line. Famous play called the Bush Push. They cross the line. They win the game. Life is good. Now, here's a weird thing. When I watch that game now, I'm not at all worried. In fact, when I see that that sack on third down instead of the first down play we needed and now it's fourth and 13 I play it in slow motion and I watch the Notre Dame guy just jump in joy I watch them high-fiving each other and I'm going sucker I know what happens next <laughs> there's not a euphemism that comes out there's not a little beat of my heart except for a joy for one simple reason, I know how the game ends. Folks, if we know how the game ends, we cannot be people of pessimism. We must be people of optimism. And you're going to be surrounded by people in your church who don't know how the game wins or knows it in their head but don't know it in their heart. And it's up to you to help them. Because I want to tell you, we will never draw the world towards the truth of the gospel if we are pessimistically defeated, angry, 
people. Optimism is vital. And I do not mean a stick your head in the sand, everything's going to go well. This is a fallen world. It's Satan's playground. Bad things happen. I know them in my own life. We face cancers. We face death. I face things. But I do know how it ends. And the damnable darkness of damnable Friday, I know Sunday's coming, and damnable Friday will be good Friday. The second thing about him is this. He had amazing humility. I pointed it out in the way that he approached uh, the guard and the person that was over the guard. But as you read Daniel on your own the rest of this week, it is just, it is freaky how humble and respectful he is. At one point, God judges Nebuchadnezzar for his pride. When he stands and says, look at this kingdom that I have built by my might for my glory. And God says, Bing, that's it, and boom. He is just totally knocked down. Well, <coughs> as prophecies come or situations come like that, Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, Oh, king, I wish it was anybody but you. I want to tell you, a lot of Christians I know would go, Oh, king, it's finally happening. Because we don't have a heart of our Lord, Ezekiel thirty three eleven. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn. We don't understand a, in our churches as a whole, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. It says, you want to be the bond, Lord's bondservant? You must be gentle, you must be kind, respectful, not resentful. And then he says, to everyone. Now, everyone includes who? Everyone. And just in case we miss it, he says, here's why. So that there is a chance that those who are held captive to do the will of the enemy, these people are actually doing the will of the enemy, like Nebuchadnezzar was, so that they might repent. When they are doing the will of the enemy, there's no room for lack of respect, there's no room for lack of gentleness, lack of kindness, and there's no room for resentment. And i got to just be honest with you, I find an awful lot of resentment in Christian circles. An awful lot of frustration, an awful lot of forgetting what Daniel knew. People who even take pride in telling off the, the co-worker who uses the name of Jesus in vain. Yeah, I just chewed him out, I told him. Oh, I told my boss this, I lost my job, I'm wearing a badge for Jesus. And I'm thinking, look at Daniel. I mean, I wonder what would happen if you're at your workplace, kind of the way we've almost been taught especially when Christianity was kind of the majority religion here, you know, wow, let's go. That if they changed, they decided, hey, everybody at work has a nickname, and your nickname now is Satan's Prince. Oh, man, we'd go to our life group or small group, and we would complain, and, rah, 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 rah. and Daniel would say, okay, just don't make it late for dinner. Call me what you want. <laughs> incredible, incredible humility and an attitude of respectfulness. Not the person, but the position. And a realization that it all started with the Lord gave. And let me tell you real practically why that's so, so important. No one likes or listens to people who don't like or respect them. If you and I want to uh, be salt and light, if we want to influence the world, understand this. It's a human trait. No one listens to people who don't like or respect them. Look at your own life. Have you, I mean, we've all had somebody, haven't we, who's kind of arrogant or whatever around it, and, or we know doesn't like us. And I want to tell you, if, if I think you don't like me, if I think you don't respect me, there is no way I'm going to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to you telling me what kind of smartphone to buy, what kind of car to buy, who to vote for, and certainly which God to worship. Because all of my human defenses are up. He was optimistic. He was humble and respectful. And the third thing he had was incredible wisdom. He picked his battles so well. He knew that there was a huge difference between what we don't like and what God forbids. God had forbidden them to eat certain things. And so Daniel very respectfully did the best he could to draw the line 
and God gave him favor, and he had success. There was another time in his life where it was his whole habit to open the door and pray towards Jerusalem. That's what he had done all these years. So his enemies, knowing they could not get him in any area of integrity, but only in the area of religion, uh, uh, talked uh, the king at that point, another guy, uh, into uh, passing a law that no one could pray or make a request to anybody but the king for, I forget how many days, 30, 60 days it was. So Daniel just opened the window once again. Not, not to do a battle, but because that's what he'd always done. I remember in our community, they passed some laws against witnessing at a, uh, uh, a mall. And all of these Christians came out of the, uh, uh, came out, uh, I don't know, out of gopher holes. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Woodwork. woodwork. I've been speaking so long I can't remember anything. <laughs> they came out of the woodwork. And to go witness at the mall and prove people you can't stop them. And I'm thinking, where were you before the law passed? If they'd been doing it before the law passed, I'm all for it. But they just said, ha, you can't push me around. It's like, what's with this? So Daniel, he was unwilling to say, okay, I'm going to shut down my God because that had been an open thing, plus God calls us to pray. But I'm also amazed at what he doesn't fight over. Uh, We've already talked about his name. It's like, I don't care. being assigned to study the occult for three years. He goes, I don't care. In fact, with the help of God, I'm going to graduate number one. You know, a lot of us would make that, that that's the final straw. I got to homeschool. And I'm not here against homeschooling or whatever. We have tons of homeschoolers, Christian schoolers, and public schoolers at North Coast. Every family's got to figure out what you're called to do. But I want to tell you, if it's like, well, I'm going to homeschool because they're teaching this here and it's out of fear rather than out of the calling of God. Here's why Daniel had the right to later on tell Nebuchadnezzar this stuff is a bunch of baloney. Because he had graduated number one in his class. Because he had proved himself a faithful servant. He had earned the right to be heard. Imagine if Daniel said, I am not going to study this. Make me a martyr. Who's going to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar? Who's going to be the one to stand in the gap and say, this is wrong, and be blessed of God to lead an entire uh, revival, as he did three times? I'm not here to play the Holy Spirit and tell us which battles to pick and which not, but I am here to encourage all of us to make sure in our churches and in our lives we are very careful and very thoughtful about which battles to pick. Where the scriptures are black and white, the scriptures are black and white. We don't have any option on how we live in those areas. But I've been amazed how easy it is to confuse the things that God forbids with the things that I don't like. Or to presume that a pagan will live as an elder. Daniel didn't make that mistake. And it's why he thrived in Babylon. A man of optimism, a man of great humility, and a man of great wisdom. I want to just share a story out of my own life and how my dad radically changed not only my life, but the life of all the people that I've ever had the privilege of helping come into the kingdom of God or grow in the glory of Jesus. My dad was a Baptist deacon at a church that in the 60s and 70s preached how we needed to go back to the 40s and 50s. I'm not painting Baptists with that broad brush. I am saying, and any Baptist friend will agree, there are some churches like that. We were that church. Uh, We didn't have our dirty dozen. We had our dirty 48 set of all kinds of rules and things like that. was just, he didn't know any better. That was, he'd come to Jesus there, and that's, he just knew this really rigid legalism. He was also a principal of a school. Mom and dad, if you look up functional parents, I'm just blessed. You will find mom and dad's picture there. They're still alive. Uh, it's like, uh, just, I'm so blessed. And they had two kids who bought into the faith. And they had one son who was a rebel. You wouldn't have any clue which one that was, would you? Fortunately, most of my rebellion was at a young enough age and under the roof that it couldn't go too far as if I had gone through some of those things in my early 20s. 
But soon as uh, I got out of uh, high school, uh, <laughs> and I mean, my last years of high school and, and early college, I went incredibly countercultural in every appearance way. I have hardly any hair anymore, but back then I had a whole lot of hair and a ponytail, but clothing. I, I remember, you know, showing up to church one week in, in flip flops, shorts, and a tank top. At that Baptist church, that was not exactly a thing to do because three weeks later we had a sermon on why you need to wear a white shirt and tie to <laughs> honor God. I am not exaggerating. But here's the thing. I had come to Jesus. I had a radical conversion to Jesus my junior into my junior year of high school. But I did not have a radical conversion to American, middle-class, suburban, white culture. I still was like the antithesis of that in virtually everything. And my mom, and, and not only did I have a radical conversion, I started talking about wanting to be a pastor. Now my mom's thinking, look what you wore to church. Of course, that's what I preach in today, minus the tank top. I look really silly in that. But she was like, well, maybe you can be a Christian, but you can't be. And my dad had such wisdom. Even though all of his friends looked at him as a failure, even though all of the school thing at those years, I mean, everything, he had the wisdom to look at the heart and just tell my mom, forget it. Maybe God has a purpose. It's a name. It's clothing. It's a piece of body art. It's a stupid little bumper sticker on his car. What's important here? And I sometimes look back and I wonder, had he not been a man of optimism, the kind of humility that he always showed others in the secular marketplace that he modeled for me, and a man with the wisdom to pick his battles carefully, what would have happened? I mean, I don't know. We've got a sovereign Lord. He knows does what he does. He can make the rock shout out and praise him if we won't. But there's a human element to things at all as well. Who's the Daniel in his community and in his family? And he would just tell you, I was just a deacon and a school teacher and a principal. No. He was a human spark that ignited three kids we're all in ministry. I'm the only one paid to be spiritual. The other two were in secular jobs doing ministry left and right, which is much more frontline and much more powerful. And it all goes back. Thriving in Babylon. We can do it. I encourage you to do it. And to study Daniel and see a man who thrived in Babylon. Thanks. We're going to grab two chairs and just give you guys 15 minutes just to sit up and ask um, both of us questions, which means they're all yours. And I'm just going to sit here beside you. But uh, we're just to uh, ask Larry a few questions, maybe off his talks um, or anything like that. But um, and we'll just go for about 10 or 15 minutes just to let you get to know him a little bit more. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Whatever you want. Line me up, put a quarter in me, and I'll do whatever I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I will say that has been this guy's attitude yesterday. Um, in the last 24 hours, he has given a six equivalent of six talks. And so we have just moved him, moved him, and moved him to different places. And he's like, where do I need to go? Let's go. And so appreciate it. Questions you might have on any of his talks? Over here. Yes. Yeah, is there a way to not buy into everything and not be completely segregated at the same time? From Yeah, I mean, I would say that's what Daniel did. He didn't buy into everything. And, and there's a time and a place, like, like for instance, uh, by the way, this is description to illustrate a principle, not prescription in any way telling you know, what you should do. 
but in my own home, uh, I was worried about my kids growing up in a pastor's home, and then as our church got quite large, in a big past, you know, where people, oh, I know your dad, and that kind of thing, which nobody wants to grow up in the shadow of somebody else. Uh, they're getting Sunday school lessons, they're hearing sermons, and their dad's a pastor. And they went to a Christian school. We, uh, there was a school in the area that gave us this ridiculous scholarship because they figured if our kids went there, maybe a bunch of other people from church would. <laughs> and so when the kids were really young, uh, we thought, well, why not? At that age, they're very susceptible to authority. Why not match what's taught in the home with what's taught in school? But I also know somewhere around junior high, kids begin to question authority. And I just decided, and again, this is just our story and the fact Christian home, really good church anyway, all of these other influences. Uh, I decided I wanted him to have the first cigarette offered to him uh, or joint or whatever it would be. I'd rather it be behind the public school gym than behind the Christian school gym. <laughs> <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> it's fair? It's a little less confusing in the public school. <laughs> and it's going to happen in both. Let's just be honest. Yes, it will. So in that environment, that's exactly what Nancy and I were testing. So we freak out a bunch of people who are fearful in our community because we took our kids in sixth grade junior high and put them into the public system. But here was the key, and so I'm speaking as with teenagers and parents because they're different than adults. I watch my kids like a hawk. You know, and weird things were done in their classrooms. I remember a movie was shown that was inappropriate, and uh, we did nothing. And my kids were so like, oh, I thought Dad was going to be a jerk. <laughs> we talked about it at home afterward and why we don't do that and why we don't say this and et cetera things. But I always had a watch on their friends. And so I'd tell a parent in that zone of, well, yeah, but kids are influential. And that's what I hear you talking about, highly influential. I just watched my kids. And they had lots of pagan friends, but they also had deep Christian rooting. If any one of my kids had shown themselves to be uh, not salt, but shown themselves to be seduced like a lot, towards Sodom, then we would have said, okay, new game. And I don't know, we would have Christian schooled them, we would have homeschooled them or whatever, because the number one congregation in everybody's life, whether you're a pastor or not, is your children. But I didn't want to raise my children isolated because the problem with, I just saw it over and over, kids that went through an isolated Christian home, God forbid, a pastor's kid, and then Christian schooling or homeschooling or whatever, the, all the way through, and then they go to college. Eventually, somebody's going to touch the sign that says wet paint. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to do it under my roof. Mm -hmm. So if they were going to get in trouble, in fact, when I remember a sheltered kid. He got drunk and fell out of a second story, third story paternity house and died, a friend of one of my sons. And thinking, you know what? And by the grace of God, they didn't do that, but we all know Christian kids and those things happen. I wanted my kids, if they got drunk, to come home and get the tar beat out of them. If they were gonna, if they were gonna fall, I wanted them to fall off a one-story roof, then suddenly off a twelve-story roof. If that makes any sense. And so, but and that's where each of us. That's that's a part of that wisdom piece, asking the question of this child in this environment of our family. You know, do we have lots of dysfunction? Do we have a lot of function? Yeah. Just how does it all, all, all mix? Uh, and for us, it worked out well. All three kids uh, are in secular environments where they're having an impact for Jesus. And I love that my grown kids all have secular jobs. They didn't go into the family business and love Jesus as passionately as I do. <laughs> you know, that's the best of all worlds. So Hollins, he is not though telling you to go smoke a joint behind the public school or the other. So just want to make sure that's clear on that. Good yeah. question. Another question. We got a mic. There we go. We got a mover. There's one over there. there. Thank you. My question from last night that I jotted down um, that I never planned on asking in front of a room full of people was in being the church and in being in ministry, caring for the middle and the back of the line but how to keep your front of the line growing and healthy and strong to balance that tension so that you don't become just yes. back of the liners or front of the liners. Yep, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a tension. What has happened is some schools have become country clubs more than armies for God. And when you're a country club, everybody's question is, I paid my dues, I'm a member. Why, why aren't you make the meal better, the course prettier? You know, it's all about me. And any church that takes on that mindset is not going to be useful to Jesus. 
but to have compassion for the outside fallen world, which we should, and compassion for the struggling believer, even the absolute back with the line person, which we should, is very different than doing two things that kill off leadership. One is ignoring sin. At North Coast, we practice church discipline. First Corinthians 5 has a list of sins that if someone claims to be a believer and they live in that, not struggle with that, it says don't even eat lunch with them, much less y'all come. So there's a difference between struggling and setting up. Well, basically, I'm all for strugglers. I'm not for people who are, are excusers or set up camp in their sin. That's a very different thing. Now, to your question of leadership, you know, most churches actually are a country club on the downside or they're officers club on the other downside. I'm calling people to be in between the two of them. And uh, the North Coast started out as an officers club because we're a high commitment church. I'm a high commitment person. 74% of our people have an identifiable area of ministry. This year, 91% of our adult weekend attendance is a number of people that not, didn't sign up but are in our weekly small groups. So we're high commitment. And what we do with leaders is we make them lead. You've all experienced in that life, right? You, uh, in your own life. You start leading, you go, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so a leadership machine doesn't have a lot of sermons about do more, do more, what I like to call drive-by guiltings. A leadership machine doesn't have lots of courses on leadership. It has lots of people who are leading. And, and, and that's how we do it. I mean, think how many leaders we have to have if 90% are in small groups. I mean, that's a million people leading Bible studies. And, and we go, this is how you're going to learn. You're not going to take, you know, a four-week course from us, followed by a semester of this and that. We go, we're going to put you in the front lines with a lifeline, and you will grow. I look at my own life and most of you. That's how we grew. I, 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 I grew deeper in the Lord the more I was called to lead. Does that help you? Does that make sense? Good question. Let me tap on, would you also say that when you kind of get to a place of front of the line, your growth sometimes can move into this mentality that it's just the academic. I need better oh. teaching, I need better this, and that surely we separate ourselves from ministry. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a huge problem with leaders. Leaders don't really want to lead, they want to get with other leaders and discuss other people. <laughs> we find it at, at North Coast, if, if we allowed it, we, we have a little thing we call North Coast U, where we teach Christian life skills, uh, everything from marriage to finances to all of that, Myers-Briggs type of things, to uh, theology uh, courses, to Bible courses you can sign up for. They're little three or four week snippets, but real intense, okay? Uh, Christian rabbi, Rabbi Bernie comes in and he'll teach you Matthew from the viewpoint of a Christian rabbi. So we have these opportunities, but we only offer them in summer when our small groups aren't going because we knew if we offered all these great deep courses during the year, all of my best leaders would take another course instead of get messy on the front lines. We had one particular ministry at North Coast, I told this, I think the story in one of the groups the other day, uh, great teacher, communicator, great seminar, great leader guy. He, he had 60 people in this one area of ministry he was pouring into with leadership training. And then he moved on to another ministry. And when he left, it dwindled down to five people leading. They all thought they had great leadership stuff. And they came to me and said, we want more courses. I said, you've had three years of courses. Lead. But they'd fallen in love with what a leader does is grow deeper and more knowledgeable. And I go, no, what a leader does is lead. And that means messy leading with people who are at the back of the line. It's so much more fun to hang out with a bunch of other front of the line people and talk about those morons at the back of the line. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. One more. All right. Dying to ask. All right. Whoop, got one right here. Larry, what are some of the ways that you reach atheists who do believe? <laughs> what are some of the ways that I justify being a Lakers fan? <laughs> <laughs> Well, God's judging me right now. God, God is already dealing with it right now. So, Larry, what are some of the ways that your leadership team uh, evaluates, uh, assesses the, the health of your many, many care groups? I, I just think that's fascinating. Fast, do we judge the health of what? Th th that, that you assess the health of your care groups. Your, your, your small groups, your growth groups. Your growth How do we groups, judge the health of our small group? Well, this is not going to sound real spiritual, the first part. 
We just judge it by retention. People stay at things that are making a difference in their life. And so uh, the first thing we ask is, are people staying in the group? And we have a leader who can't keep people in the group. We know we have somebody not called to be a leader, not gifted to be a leader, or just informational because they're not relational. So that would be the first thing. Then the second thing is, sorry, i got to get up to say this one. i got some passion on it. Oh, man. <laughs> Clear then, up. then we'll take an offering. Okay. <laughs> it's church now. <laughs> yeah. I think we make a mistake, and a lot of you have been exposed to it. We try to measure spirituality with man-made rules. So we say things. We do a survey. How many people have you talked to about Jesus in the last two weeks? How Christian is your worldview? Have you read the Bible in the previous period of time? Have, are you with me on all that list? None of those things tell you whether you're becoming a disciple, moving towards the front of the line. One of my favorites is how much you've read the Bible. Now you catch, I'm a Bible guy, right? I mean, we, we try to get our people to treat it as a life textbook and all that. But I want to always remind myself that before the Gutenberg Press, nobody had daily devotions because they didn't have a Bible. It's not reading the Bible a verse a day will keep the devil away. It's doing the Bible. Dyslexics can be spiritual. Men, you can be spiritual. <laughs> For real. Hey, Jesus. <laughs> Publishers, I'm a writer, I know this. Publishers go, oh my goodness, what do we do? Because 55% of American men will never read a book cover to cover after they graduate from high school. Now, when I say that to some groups, they go, oh no, well, they're readers. Because everybody else goes, of course. <laughs> and if our spirituality is judged by how much you read rather than how you live, we've got a spirituality that doesn't work for a whole bunch of people. Which is why, by the way, Christian bookstores are aimed at women 35 to 45 years old. Now, here's why I say that. Think with me for a moment. Can a doctor tell you, and I'm going to answer how we know our small groups. I am getting to that. I just got passionate. <laughs> Can a doctor tell you you're healthy? Ah, trick question. Yes. Uh, no, he can't. He can tell you there's no detectable illness. He cannot tell you're healthy. After my wife's cancer, every time we go in, all they say is no detectable cancer. We don't know whether there's cancer there or not. We've all heard story of some guy who got a clean bill of health and walked out and fell down dead. Here's what a doctor can tell you very well. You're sick. See, the doctor looks for symptoms of sickness. Now, here's where I'm going to go with how we judge. Retention tells us the whole social thing and all that of it, which is very important. And then we anecdotally look for sin. When I don't find a lot of sin breaking out, it doesn't mean we're healthy. But when I find a lot of sin breaking out in certain areas, then we go at it. Man, more marriages than we're used to are falling apart right now. Hey, there's more drug addiction over here. There's more of this. And then we go at it. And, and I think a lot of churches, when they do a spiritual health test, test make the mistake of having this list of things. And here, by the way, how, is how I learned it. I had six key mentors in the first three years of my life. And if being a mature Christian means you know the Bible inside out, all six matched. If being a mature Christian means you're assertive and aggressive and sharing your faith, all six matched. If being a Christian means you read the Bible daily, all six matched. They were type A personalities, type A Christians. I mean, whatever it is, in every single test of church health, all of these were A's. Three of them had moral failures. They couldn't keep their pants on, but they could read their Bible every day. And that was where I learned my lesson. I'm not going to judge spirituality by a bunch of outward tools. I will never turn a tool into a rule. I'll expose our congregation to all the tools. Hey, have you tried this kind of inductive Bible study? Have you done this? Have you tried this kind of a prayer walk? Have you done this? But none of them are rules by which you judge spirituality. They are tools by which you can become spiritual. And the tool that is the wonderful tool for one might not be the tool for another. I am a reader. 
My wife is an accountant, educated and all that, reads technical stuff, but she likes to read fiction. She doesn't, I don't think she's read a nonfiction book in ages. She does not read her Bible every single day with a little pen, like a good pastor's wife marking it up. She just is so far in front of the line of following Jesus, further in front of me, than I know what to do with. And I don't sit to her and say, honey, you got to read it again today. Because she knows it and she lives it. She gets it through sermons. She reads it when there's a Bible study. Does this, I'm just trying to be as honest and real as I can with you. Because there is so much garbage out there of gift projection and making people feel guilty when they're walking with Jesus in great, great obedience and other people filled with pride because they're checking off the list and Jesus doesn't have a part of them. They've got a little closet sent over here or that. So we gave up all those stupid tests because I found too many people passing the test <laughs> who weren't really passing the test. And we look for sin. And when we see it, we don't wring our hands, we go at it. 